Dear friends and colleagues, I'm very sorry for not being there with you in person, but I'm also very glad to share with you this lecture about board games in patristic literature, which is an area that has never been explored before by any board game studies scholar. What should we expect from this lecture and from patristic literature? At first, I have to say that this is just a small selection of the passages related to board games in patristic literature. And then we have to know that the Christians were different from the other people of their time. They shared the same collective imagination and they used the same uh, common sayings. So there were many points of contact between pagan and Christians. So something we cannot expect to find in patristic literature are different board games or new and unknown board games or a description of their rules or a description of the patterns incised on the gaming boards. But something we can expect is a very precise and in-depth analysis of the moral implication of gambling. About this fact, I have to say that the consideration of the early Christian writers about gambling isn't different from the one of Cicero or from the one expressed by several Greek authors or even by the Babylonian Talmud. So, Christians were definitely people of their time and now we are going to analyze their literature according to this perspective. And now let's speak about the common traditions. We have to say that the relation between uh, Christianity and board games uh, didn't start well as we can easily understand by the reading of those two passages. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was a seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who as it will be, in order that the passage of the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. With this premise, one will assume that at least the Christians of the very first period refused and rejected any kind of practice that required randomizing tools. And so, after Judah's defection, the apostles felt the need to fill the ranks and found two possible candidates. Then they prayed, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry from which Judas turned away, to go to his own place. Well, at that time, the councils were still an option, so then they gave lots to them, and the lots fell upon Matthias, and he was counted with the eleven apostles. So the practice of casting lots uh, to decide about matters of extreme importance uh, was quite common among uh, all the culture of the Near East and is uh, well attested among the Sumerians and also among the Jewish uh, by several biblical passages. This is an example of how the Christians shared the same tradition of the other people around them. And now let's speak about the common sayings. The ancient uh, Greek author Hipponax wrote, Why do you play me tricks? And interestingly, he used the word skirafois, which means dice shaker to indicate the tricks. And more or less six centuries later, Saint Paul writes, so that we may no longer be infants tossed by waves and swept along by every wind of teaching arising from human trickery, reckoning in the interest of deceitful scheming. This passage of St. Paul has been always translated in this way, since the very first period and since the very first uh, Latin translations. But uh, the expression human trickery, in fact in Greek, uh, in the original Greek text, uh, is given by the word uh, uh, Kubeia, Kubeia ton androhon, which literally means uh, the uh, dice of men. So the word dice was used in the Greek uh, culture to indicate uh, trickery because of the habits of the gamblers to trick, uh, uh, to play tricks among them, to be dishonest. And this has been clearly explained by John Chrysostom in a uh, anomaly in which he comments this letter of Saint Paul. He comes to this figure of speech to point out in how great peril the opting souls are. With every win, says he, by the slate of man in craftiness, after the wise of error. The word slaves means the heart of gamesters. 
such are the crafty whenever they lay hold on this simple sort, for they also change and shift about everything. He here glances as also at human life. And to point out the persistence of a common saying within a culture, we can read the first sermon that John Chrysostom gave when he was ordained as a presbyter in the 4th century. He is very stressed because of his first sermon and he asked the people to pray for him. And in fact, you will satisfy a duty of justice by fulfilling our wishes. For you and your charity, I cast the die of a most violent and most tyrannical challenge. This expression, casting a die, was more or less the same that Caesar used on the Rubicon. To cast a die means to try the chance, to gamble. And with this expression, uh, John Chrysostom is referring to the fact that uh, it's quite a gamble for him to appear in front of so many people to give his very first speech. And now let's speak about the common imagination. In the early 1st century, Ovid wrote that there is a kind of game and the board is square off by as many lines with precise calculation as the fleeting years and months. And uh, six uh, centuries later, um, Isidore of Seville, in his etymologies, wrote the figurative sense of dicing. Furthermore, certain dice players think that they perform their art by way of an allegory of natural science and conceive of it as bearing a certain likeness to natural phenomena. They maintain that they play with three dice because of the three tenses of the world, present, past and future, because they do not stand still but tumble down. They also hold that the paths on the board are divided into six regions for the ages of a human and in three lines for the three tenses. Hence, they say that a gaming board is marked off in three lines. So, in the 6th and 7th century, this idea that the board could represent the year or the time, and the board is much, most probably the same, they are referring most probably at the same game. So, uh, the cultural interpretation of the popular interpretation of this game never changed. And sometimes uh, Christian Hothor had to deal with very strong and very persistent um, figures of the common imagination, legendary figures of the common imagination. We all know the history of uh, Romulus and Remo and, uh, and the She-Wolf, and uh, something that we might not know is that uh, among the Romans there were another legend in which the she was she she wasn't uh, an animal she was a prostitute which was called acca larentia or larentina and for her profession she was also called lupa from which the term lupanare comes from the term that indicates the roman brothels and also plutarch tells the story of how she has been hired by the priest of uh, the temple of hercules to please the god in during a very particular occasion. And Tertullian, a Christian author, during the second century AD, so it was more or less contemporary of Plutarch, deals with the same figure of the collective imagination, trying to analyze the history from another perspective and another point of view. I asked them to even more abominable cases. Your writers have not been ashamed to publish that of Larentina. She was a hired prostitute, whether as the nurse of Romulus, and therefore called Lupa, she-wolf, because she was a prostitute, or as the mistress of Hercules, now deceased, that uh, is to say, now deified. They relate that his temple warder happened to be playing at the counters in the temple alone, and in order to represent a partner for himself in the game, in the absence of an actual one, he began to play with one hand for Hercules and the other hand for himself. The condition was that if he won the stake from Hercules, he should with them procure a supper and a prostitute. Hercules, however, proved the winner, I mean his other hand, then he should provide the same for Hercules. The hand of Hercules won. That achievement might well have been added to his twelve labors, and the temple warden 
buys a supper for the hero and hires Larentina to play the war. The fire, which dissolved the body of even a Hercules, enjoyed the supper. The altar consumed everything. Larentina sleeps alone in the temple, and she, a woman from the brothel, boasts that in her dream she had submitted herself to the pleasure of Hercules, and she might possibly have experienced this as it passed through her mind in her sleep. In the morning, on going out of the temple very early, she is solicited by a young man, which is a third Hercules, so to speak. He invites her home and she complies, remembering that Hercules had told her that it would be for her advantage. He then, to be sure, obtains the permission that they should be united in a lawful wedlock, for none was allowed to have intercourse with the concubine of a god without being punished for it. The husband makes her his heir. By and by, just before her death, she bequeathed to the Roman people the rather large estate which she had obtained through Hercules. After this, she soaked deification for her doctors too, whom indeed the divine Larentina ought to have appointed her heirs also. The gods of the Romans received an accession in her dignity, for she alone, of all the wives of Hercules, was there to him, because she alone was rich, and she was even far more fortunate than Ceres, who contributed to the pleasure of the king of the dead. After so many examples and eminent names among you, who might not have been declared divine? And now let's speak about the superstition shared by both the Christians and the pagans. During the antiquity, the Homeric hero Palamedes was considered to be the inventor of dice and dice board, and uh, some other authors remarked that the movement of the stones on the gaming board looked like the motion of stars, and uh, Clearchus especially says that it is analogous to the five planets, so that it might be connected to astrology. And as we can easily expect, astrology and fortune-telling wasn't very appreciated by the Christian authors and Christian intellectuals, because it was considered a kind of a superstition. And so a Christian author of the 2nd century AD wrote, But men formed the material of their apostasy, for having shown them a plan of the position of the stars, like their players, they introduced fate, a flagrant injustice. Thus the high-spirited and he was crushed with toil, the temperate and the intemperate, the indigent and the wealthy, are what they are simply from the controllers of their nativity. For the delineation of the zodiacal circle is the work of gods, and when the light of one of them predominates, as they express it, it deprives all the rest of their honor, and he who now is conquered at another time gains the predominance and the seven planets are well pleased with them, as if they were amusing themselves with dice. So Tatian was very critical toward the superstition uh, of the Greeks. But John Malalas, who is an author of the 6th century AD, uh, that came from the same region of Tatian, they were both Syrians, he wrote it was he who first devised the game of tabla from the movement of the seven planets that bring men's joys and griefs by the hazard of fate. He made the tabla board by the terrestrial world, the twelve cases, their number is equal to the sign of the zodiac, and the dice box and the seven counters in it are the seven stars, and the tower the height of heaven, from which good and evil are distributed to all. So, after a such long time, in the same region, John Malalas, who was Christian, he still believed that it was possible to forecast the future, maybe also using a, a board game. Interestingly, the same passage has been copied in a text of the 11th century in Constantinople, during the Middle Age, when the uh, sensibility of the people uh, was already changed a lot. And for the reason, the person who copied this text of uh, John Malalast corrected it, removing the word goods. So, not good and evils comes from uh, astrology, but just evil. So, Christian and pagans, they had many, many points of contact. 
speaking about uh, gaming tradition and gaming culture. But as I say in the introduction, the Christian authors provide also an external point of view on some uh, implication, moral and social implication of the gaming practice. And this has been described very well in a reprimand, in a sermon uh, written uh, by an anonymous bishop in the 3rd century AD. It's written in 11 chapters, he has a very long sermon and is completely dedicated to the gamblers. In fact, this treaty is called De Aleatoribus. In describing the temptations and devices of the gamblers, he described also very well how a gambling house could look like. We attest uh, to the origin of this sacrilegious and even criminal game by the testimony of other authors. A certain person well versed in literature, but undoubtedly under the influence of the devil, who filled the inventor with his tricks, after much reflection invented this dismally destructive practice. He was the first person who talked this game to men and to make a cultic cool object of it. He fashioned statues bearing his image, therefore he erected his own statue inscribed with his own name and thereby, following the devil's suggestion, was led uh, to concoct this detestable game. He caused his dreadful statue to be set up in some high place, bearing in his arm this gambling board, so that the originator appears simultaneously as an inventor and player of this evil game. By having this image represented in statues and reproductions, this inventor originated another crime, that of having a religious cult paid to him by his religious devotees. He instituted, as a rule, that honor of sacrifice be offered to him in such a way that anyone who wants to take up this game cannot put his hand to the dice without first offering a sacrifice to its originator. He arranged things in such a way that, because of who he was prior to the invention of dice, he merited after his death to be honored with the false name of God by his wayward sectarians. Thanks to him, we came to know that in the gambling houses there were sculptures of Palamedes and that the players offered sacrifice to him, and also that the player was a sort of a sect with its own initiation ritual. But he also provided us very interesting and useful details. Then, after all their own fortune have been wasted, they overwhelmed themselves with borrowed money. Think of the insanity of these murderous, destructive hands, which cannot be stopped by winning, but continue to play even after loss. Pagan authors never mention the presence of usurer in the gambling houses, but it's something that we could easily expect. Also, the presence of the prostitutes, which is pointed out in the treaty De Aleatoribus in another passage. And in fact, Saint Ambrose, Bishop of Milan in the 4th century AD, provides us a very detailed description of a gambling house and helps us to have a more precise and realistic idea of what could mean gamble and being gamblers in the past. Here another instance of no less bitterness. These men watch the boots of the gamblers and esteem as their own advantage the distress of the loser. They pledge for each one at first chance, gives various issues. Victory is often transferred to different ones, and its gains and losses change alternately. All lose and win, the usurer alone acquired. Others have the empty name that they have won. With the usurer alone is the gain, not yearly, but every instant. They alone make a profit in the loss of everyone. Theirs alone is the interest given by victory. You may see the rest now needy, now rich, then stripped, changing their condition with every throw, for their life is staked like a die, their fortunes rolls on the playing table, a game is made of danger, and the danger results from game. So many stakes, so many notices of public sale. There is the shouting of those who applaud, the weeping of those who are ruined, the groaning of those who bewail themselves. Among them sits the creditor like a tyrant, condemning everyone to capital punishment. He plants his spear, he begins the fateful auction of the spoil of each one. Some he condemns to public sales, others to slavery. Not so many have been put to death under tyrants. I will then more rightly call this the hazard of life than of money. In a moment that is proposed which may hold forever. Drunkenness judges and no one appeals. 
a dice game also has its own rules, which the laws of the form may not render void. If it can be believed, he is the branded with disgrace who thinks he should resist, and the censure of this infamous man brands a deeper opprobrium upon him than the sentence of a court, since those who are condemned before a judge are heroes to the former. Those who are condemned by them are also blameworthy before a judge. Moses established a famous council of elders. They, however, were accustomed to judge the easier cases. A major decision that is concerning the more important matters they used to reserve for Moses to judge. Here it is said the council of gamesters has judged, and their power is more fear than that of a lion. Summarizing what has been described uh, in this lecture, we can see that Greek patristic shows an higher literary level, especially in the earlier periods. It was written by erudite people, sometimes for other scholars, uh, of, or for erudite detractors of the Christian faith, but fortunately and unconsciously, they provide us a lot of information about ancient gaming practice, because they use many expressions and common sayings that were, that were taken from everyday life and popular culture, but also from their contemporary literature. And it was clearly part of their cultural habits to refer to board games uh, in this way, and this is very interesting and useful for us. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Latin patristic uh, had a lower literary level, it was written by literate, literate people, but probably not the finest uh, scholar of their time, but their sermons address it to the lowest level of the, of the society. So, common sayings, erudite common sayings like uh, uh, the one used by the Greeks uh, aren't attested among the Latin authors, but fortunately they provide us a very vivid and realistic description of the gambling house, much more precise than any pagan authors. In complex, we can remark, thanks to both, the relevance of gaming practice for the ancient and late ancient society. Well, this is my selection of the most interesting passages related to board games in patristic literature. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, I hope this can help you to develop your speculation about the history of board games and I hope to see you in person as soon as possible.